So we look at the approaches to war and the use of force. There can be three main categories of stances. The first would be pacifism, which is the tendency towards nonviolence. Another would be just war or justified war, which we'll get into shortly. And then the third strategy would be total war. Total war means uh, doing anything and everything possible to win. It should come as no surprise that the Catholic Church does not endorse total war, but it does allow for Catholics to support either pacifism or justified war. Now, when we start looking at pacifism, there can actually be two categories of pacifism. First would be principled or absolute pacifism. This is the belief that violence is inherently evil and therefore is never an acceptable means. The second would be pragmatic pacifism. This acknowledges that violence could theoretically be acceptable, but given the circumstances of the world, it is almost or is never as effective as peaceful means. All Christian pacifism is based on a rejection of violence in some way, shape, or form. Now, when you look into the history of the church, for the first three centuries of Christianity, the church was nearly 100% pacifist. For one thing, there is not a single theologian that we know of that accepted the use of violence. Um, and there are many theologians who speak against it. Tertullian, for example, Origen as another, and St. Martin of Tours, who was a soldier uh, who, upon converting to Christianity, decided to renounce violence. Now, of course, we should ask why. Why was the early Christian church pacifist? One reason would be actually a repudiation of idolatry. A big conflict between the Roman Empire and Christian faith was that Romans, and in particular soldiers, were asked to swear an oath of loyalty to the emperor. Christians would be averse to doing this because oaths of loyalty should be made only to God, and making an oath of loyalty to the emperor could be seen as a form of idolatry. Another practical concern was the apocalyptic worldview. The early Christians believed that Christ was going to be coming back soon to establish his kingdom. And so it wouldn't really make any sense to get involved in political and military affairs when uh, the main task at hand was to spread the gospel as quickly as possible while we still had time. Another reason would be the aversion to Rome. Um, at various time periods throughout the first three centuries, Christians were brutally persecuted. And so it might make sense to ask why a Christian would uh, be willing to join in the Roman uh, army when, in fact, the army was often persecuting them. And then finally, there is a real sense of adhering to Jesus' commands and lifestyle. So when we look into the New Testament, we've already studied Jesus' teaching, upon teaching on retaliation, an eye for an eye, uh, giving also your cloak and going the extra mile. These three examples serve as nonviolent resistance. As we noted, turning the other cheek is a uh, creative way to take away the attacker's power, but it does not do so by uh, using violence uh, in response. The same can be said for handing him your cloak as well, and for going the extra mile. Now these are not just isolated incidents. There are also is a general theme of nonviolence running throughout the New Testament. Um, another example being in the Beatitudes when Jesus says that the peacemakers are blessed, and of course when he says that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. There are other passages as well that contribute to this stance toward nonviolence. Um, again, with rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, Jesus does not tell us to violently rebel against unjust structures, um, but rather to figure out ways to operate justly within them. Uh, and to reform them. Also, when Peter strikes the guard's ear in the agony of the garden, Jesus says, those who live by the sword die by the sword. And in St. Paul's letters, we have the powerful passage of the armor of God being more effective than the armor of men. Armor of God being things like faith, um, devotedness, etc. And again, this goes beyond proof texting. This is not just picking individual passages. The overall tone of the New Testament is one of peace. So what changes? Well, in the fourth century, we know that Christianity becomes legal. Um, and also in the fourth century, you have the rise of several prominent theologians, uh, the first of whom, as it relates to justified war, is St. Ambrose. 
uh, St. Ambrose, uh, when he looked at the beginning history of the church, he noticed that the Pax Romana, or peace of Rome, was necessary in order to spread the development of Christianity. In other words, if Rome had not exerted uh, political rule over such a wide area, St. Paul and the other missionaries would not have been able to spread the word of Christ so easily. And so he endorses the use of violence that would advance peace. Um, he insists, however, that this violence must be limited. And he does this not just through his words, but through his actions. So, for example, when Emperor Theodosius responded um, to some people he didn't like in Thessalonica, uh, who had slayed one of his um, ambassadors, and he comes in and actually slays um, hundreds of innocent people, St. Ambrose actually excommunicates the emperor because he had uh, used force unjustly. Now, just war theory is going to be later developed by St. Ambrose's uh, student, St. Augustine, centuries later by St. Thomas Aquinas, and by many others as well. So, a brief overview of the conditions of justified war. We can divide justified war into three areas. One would be justice before the war. And the principles of justified war before the war include the following. First, there has to be a just cause. A just cause is going to be defined as a legitimate defense of one's uh, country, of one's life. It can also be a defense of the human lives and basic rights of others. It cannot, however, be a war of retribution. Preemptive uh, causes are sometimes considered valid, uh, but preventative violence is not. And the difference between that is a pre preemptive measure is when there is a real and present threat whereas preventative violence is preventing a threat from even emerging in the first place. Also, it has to be uh, announced by proper authority. In other words, any ordinary citizen cannot simply call everybody else to arms. It has to be a recognized authority that can declare war. Um, now, this does not exclude possible wars against tyranny, as long as the leadership of uh, the rebellion is going to be recognized by those who are involved in it. It also has to include the right intention. In other words, those who are going to war and those who call war have to intend to protect life and restore peace. The intent cannot be for personal gains or revenge. It also must be the last resort. In other words, all peaceful alternatives for legitimate defense must be exhausted before the use of violence could be seen as potentially acceptable. And finally, on a practical note, there has to be a probability of success. The reasoning behind this is that if there is no probability of success, well, then all that's happening is uh, essentially pointless killing. So probability, probability of success has to be in place. The second phase is justice during the war. During the war, uh, combatants must practice discrimination, which means they must discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. Another way of phrasing this simply is that civilians may not be seen as legitimate targets. Uh, both sides also must, must engage or abide by proportionality. And what that means is that the good um, achieved by the means have to outweigh the evil that is done. All right, so the scale of the response should not greatly exceed the scale of the attack. Um, if one country uh, attacks another and kills a dozen, soldier, a dozen soldiers, a uh, nuclear response, for example, would not be seen as proportionate. And then finally, there is the consideration of justified war after the war. And this includes just termination. Just termination means that conditional solutions must be offered. Uh, unconditional surrender is not seen as a just termination um, for many reasons, one of which is that it would continue to provide uh, motivation for uh, both sides to continue to fight when perhaps there could be a situation that would result in peace. And finally, there has to be restitution. Regardless of who was the original aggressor, the victor has the responsibility to repair damage done to the opponents, again, even when the opponents are attackers. And you might question why that's the case. Um, in many cases, it's simply because it works. Um, if you compare, for example, the aftermath of World War I in Europe versus the aftermath of World War II, um, when the victors uh, pumped money into the economies of those countries that were defeated after World War II and resulted in much faster recovery, whereas after World War I, when uh, the central powers were forced to pay reparations, uh, 
uh, that plunged them into a depression, which of course led to further conflict. And so again, a brief overview of the conditions of justified war, justice before the war, during the war, and after the war. And in order for a war to be considered just, all of these conditions must be met.